Welcome, everyone. So as Pierce said, I have the pleasure of uh, moderating the session on neighborhoods and inequality. Uh, this topic is interesting in its own right, but it's also really useful for us for thinking through some of the complexities of systems of inequality, some of those uh, complexities uh, we talked about uh, yesterday and this morning, of course. Uh, we can think of spatial inequality as itself a cause and a consequence of other dimensions of inequality. Uh, and in addition, spatial inequality is kind of like a container for multiple dimensions of inequality. So it's a great place for really thinking through and teasing out apart uh, some of the complexities we've been addressing. Given the importance of the topic, we're very lucky to have uh, two eminent scholars of, on spatial inequalities in the United States, Professor Rachel Cleet and Professor Chris Browning. And for those of us here at OSU, uh, we're lucky to have them here every day. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about their work today. So to me, um, both these scholars really embody the Compass series. They're, interdiscipli they're interdisciplinary. Uh, they're committed to thinking deeply about um, inequality and its complexities. Um, and as social scientists, as sort of the representatives of the social scientist uh, piece here, uh, they think very carefully about the empirical evidence uh, and work to build useful theory from that. And we'll try to, especially in the moderated discussion, kind of try to push and, and think a little bit about how uh, this work and social scientists work in this area more generally might connect to philosophical questions and, and might be enriched by um, philosophy and, and philosopher, philosophers' uh, questions. So we'll pursue that more in the, in the uh, uh, discussion. Uh, both also have the distinction of having developed deep knowledge about Columbus and our local area, and I'm excited especially to hear about that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about them before they speak. I'll, I'll start with Chris Browning, who's the first to go today. Uh, he's professor of sociology and faculty affiliate of the Institute for Population Research here at OSU. His research interests include the causes and consequences of community social organization, the neighborhood context of crime, risk behavior, and health, the long-term effects of maltreatment during childhood and multi-level statistical models. He's also a principal investigator on the Adolescent Health and Development in Context study, which is a large-scale, longitudinal investigation of the link between socio-spatial socio exposures and developmental outcomes among youth in Franklin County, here in Franklin County. And today we're going to be hearing some you know, very early, um, hot off the presses, um, results from this study. So this is really a world premiere in addition uh, uh, to being uh, a conference on spatial inequality. So uh, excited about that. Professor Rachel Cleet is professor and section head of the City and Regional Planning Program uh, in the Knowlton School of Architecture here at OSU. Dr. Cleet's research interests include housing mobility and location choice, affordable housing policy, housing as a poverty alleviation strategy, equity impacts of economic development, and urban and regional disparities. She founded and leads the Housing Dialogue Group here in Columbus, which brings together academics and practitioners uh, to address neighborhood inequality and housing issues um, here in our metropolitan area. So she brings a rich perspective on neighborhood inequality, both from that academic perspective, but also in really having um, knowledge of the practitioner community um, and how they're thinking about these concerns. So should I say excited one more time? I'm excited <laughs> to hear about what they're going to say. So uh, Chris is going to go first, then Rachel, they'll each talk for about 10-ish minutes. Probably will go a little bit longer than that. And then um, I'll raise some questions and we'll have a discussion amongst the three of us. Uh, and then we'll open up for audience Q&A. Okay. What's that? Yeah, you know, we're, we're thinking we're going to sit so we can yeah. see you. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, and thanks for the invitation to present today. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm, um, uh, I'm going to be talking about neighborhood inequality more generally, but um, I'll also present some data uh, from this project because I, I can't help it. Uh, I have to present some data here. Um, it's also going to be on the local area, and I think uh, it, it should be of, of, of some interest to folks and help us uh, try to understand both how we study neighborhood inequality um, descriptively, how do we characterize it, and how do we understand the consequences of it. Um, and I'm, I'm also going to call into question the concept of neighborhood uh, a, a bit here and then and try to leave that open um, for conversation as well. Okay, so I'll start with a, a little discussion of the, the current state of neighborhood inequality, uh, talk about why it matters, a little bit about what we know with respect to uh, the impact of neighborhood inequality. I'm going to focus on youth outcomes. 
and a lot of this literature has focused heavily on the consequences of social and spatial environments for the development of youth, um, although uh, this literature also spans across the life course. Um, I'll talk about the mechanisms of neighborhood influence. What is it about living in disadvantaged neighborhoods that causes problems for youth development now, over and above their immediate family contexts? Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, I'll talk about uh, the Adolescent Health and Development in Context study, which is, is based here in Franklin County. Okay, so uh, you will not be surprised to know that uh, there are pro profound differences across neighborhoods with respect to socioeconomic well-being, first and foremost. Um, a recent uh, report out of the Urban Institute characterized uh, this inequality uh, in fairly dramatic fashion. So just to take the extremes, um, we can look at the most advantaged census tract in the U.S. Census tracts are about 4,000 people. Um, 466,000 average annual income, median housing value uh, approaching a million, and over 90% college educated. The least advantage, uh, there's, a, there's a tie here. Uh, the least advantage two census tracts are roughly uh, characterized by about 16,000 uh, average annual income, uh, median housing less than 40,000, and very low levels of college uh, uh, education. So the most advantaged track, where is that? Well, it's right outside, uh, well, Chevy Chase, Maryland. Okay, so DC. Anyone want to guess where the least advantaged track is? It's a few miles south of where we are right now. <laughs> well, my old neighbor is 4205, well, and it's close. It's, it's, it's close. close. Um, okay, Franklinton. Uh, this is a, a census tract just west of downtown here in Columbus. And uh, it has the dubious distinction of being tied with the census tract in Memphis for uh, occupying the least advantaged uh, position on a, a scale of socioeconomic uh, disadvantage and advantage that this Urban Institute report used. So uh, we'll refer back to this. This is not giving you the, the full range of information about central tendency, and se et cetera, for track dis disadvantage and inequality. But I just want to give you the extremes, and in part because we have the uh, low end right here. And I will come back to that uh, when we actually sh uh, view some maps of the local context and how uh, tracks vary on key dimensions, not only socioeconomic status, but other features of the social environment. So what's the consequence of living in a high poverty neighborhood? Much of this is not surprising as well. Uh, s dramatically higher levels of crime and violence in high poverty neighborhoods, uh, STD, HIV rates, teen pregnancy and childbirth, uh, rates of low birth weight and infant mortality, psychological distress, reduced physical health, diminished educational outcomes, uh, school dropout, all of these have been well documented as associated with high residents in a high poverty neighborhood. Um, and I should point out here that we can do these analyses at the track level. We can show the association between a poverty rate and a, a rate of uh, teen childbirth or infant mortality, for instance. But we can also do these analyses in, in a multi-level way. That is, embed individuals in their neighborhoods, account for the individual level characteristics that might be associated with these outcomes, and then show that above and beyond those individual level predispositions or whatever you want to call them, their context still influences their outcomes over and above individual predispositions. Um, consequences of high poverty for long-term economic prospects. There's been some uh, very visible research recently linking early uh, residents in a high poverty neighborhood to long-term uh, income. And this is using a quasi-experimental, 
call it just straight experimental design, where uh, families were r randomly assigned from a high poverty uh, neighborhood to move to a low poverty neighborhood to Section 8 housing or to a control group. And youth who experienced that move in early childhood uh, over the long term have improved uh, in incomes. What are the reasons why uh, these outcomes may be a function of living in a, 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 a economically disadvantaged neighborhood? Well, economic disadvantage is not the only thing that might matter. Uh, it's also racial segregation above and beyond economic disadvantage. Residential instability, lots of turnover in the population. Form-born composition, that turns out to be beneficial for almost every one of these intervening mechanisms. What are these possible intervening mechanisms? The quality and composition of the organizational and institutional environment, schools being a key example, uh, 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 lower quality schools uh, well documented to reside in high poverty neighborhoods. Collective efficacy, the normative expectations about intervening on behalf of others in the environment, to improve well-being. Violence and disorder impact on mental health uh, and physical health and uh, physiological stress. Social ecologies, public spaces that are viable and well used related to the density of organizations, the quality of organizations. And social network ties. Uh, are communities characterized by neighbors who know one another, who encounter one another in public space and so on. All these factors have been hypothesized as mechanisms that link structural disadvantage to health and well-being at the individual level. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly move through um, a description of the data that we use, and then I'm gonna show you some maps, our, the way in which we first collect the data on social environment, and then some maps that characterize uh, Columbus. You're good. Oh, okay. All right. So, um, as uh, Rachel mentioned, this is an ongoing study in the uh, Franklin County area. We're just very recently done with the first wave, which is why this is hot off the presses uh, data. Uh, it's a sample of about 1,400 youth and their caregivers. Uh, my co-investigators are Kate Calder, uh, Jody Ford, Elizabeth Cooksey, all of OSU and Maple Kwan of uh, University of Illinois. Okay, so what mechanisms are most important in explaining the link between structural disadvantage and well-being? Um, what we do is we collect information on locations in a survey context. We ask people to say, where do you go for grocery shopping, school, work, uh, your, your relative's house, friend's house, and so on. And we get an actual X, Y coordinate for that. And then we give a, the youth a smartphone for a week, text them, questions oh, five times over the course of the day about what they're doing, who they're with, how they're feeling, and so on. Then we come back at the end of the week, and we sit down, we walk the youth through five days to fill in information, and then we have the caregiver report on characteristics of these routine locations. Lots of different uh, uh, information about each of those locations. Uh, and then we also have a biomeasure component here as well. Okay, so here are the locations, workplace, school, library, et cetera, a lot of different places the caregiver will report, yes, I have one of these as a routine location, and then we'll follow up and ask a series of questions uh, about each of those X, Y coordinates, and this is, uh, we use Google Maps to locate these, uh, and then uh, that's how we're getting this map-based information. So, although we only have 1,400 caregivers, which is a lot, uh, because they report on six to eight locations, we have a lot of location reports here. Okay, so a lot of information about to, to spread over a, a comparatively small city, given the way uh, most of these community surveys have been done in the past uh, on larger cities like LA and Chicago. All right, so quickly the demographics of uh, the Columbus area. Uh, percent white, you can see this is one of the most segregated areas one of the most segregated cities in the nation. Uh, a very uh, obvious east-west divide here. Uh, African-American population in the Near East side here, uh, predominantly uh, the, the highest concentration. 
not a, a, a large Hispanic population here, but arguably growing. Um, percent of the population with a, a college degree here, uh, again, some, again, the Northwest, high concentrations of, of uh, college uh, education. Without a high school degree. <laughs> okay, better? Okay. So I want, you, I want you to notice that there is a divide here, of course, in education. Note this area. See that track? That's the worst off track in the country. Okay. Unfortunately, we don't have data on that track. We didn't get quite enough data to make a reliable assessment of what's going on there. It's a relatively small track. But we have this one. Watch what happens. This is very closely connected to, uh, it's also Franklinton. All right, uh, percent of families in poverty. Uh, you'll see here, uh, this whole area includes suburbs. Those of you who live here know this, Worthington, Upper Arlington, Bexley. These are our very advantaged suburbs. You will see them also sticking out, okay. Violent crime rate, we don't have uh, that suburban data here, but you can see, as one would expect based on what we know, higher poverty, uh, lower economic advantage uh, areas are um, ex experience uh, much higher rates of violent crime. Okay, this is our data, and I'll get through this quickly. I have a couple minutes. Okay, yeah. Um, all right. So this is the percent of locations in the census tract the caregivers know uh, someone was attacked at that location. So they go there on a regular basis, but they're aware, yeah, somebody uh, was beaten or there was a fight and so on. Okay, which could have implications for how you experience that location in your everyday life. So you can see the relative absence, near zero. People don't go to locations where they know someone was attacked in the northwest side of the city. But of course, that uh, percentage increases pretty significantly in this area. Um, you can see the scale here, up to 50% of locations in those higher areas. Okay, there's our, our census track in Franklinton. Social disorder, visible cues in the environment, gang activity, uh, prostitution, drug selling, and so on, visible in the environment, which has been linked with mental health, physiological distress, and so on. Okay, once again, it's a very similar pattern here. Um, at concentration in this at a relatively segregated area here. I should note, this track is minority, uh, majority white. It's not a 100% white track, but it's a majority white track, okay? So, uh, but it has comparable levels of poverty to the areas up here, okay? Is that North Windsor? Oh, this right here? What is I actually don't, I don't know, that, that's right, if it isn't Linden, it's right near. That's what I thought. Yeah. Physical disorder. Uh, physical signs of decline, vacant lots, trash on the street, graffiti, and so on, also have been linked with mental health, are hypothesized to be linked with crime, it's a bit more controversial. Same pattern here. Um, Ecologies, locations where caregivers spend time in public. Are people using the space in the neighborhood? Okay, uh, these uh, brighter colors, lower rates. You can see same general pattern here. Uh, once again, Franklinton sticking out, very low rates of public space use. Locations where caregivers think neighbors are watchful, that is that there's monitoring going on. When I go to this location, I can make sure, uh, I'm, I feel confident that people are watching the, the space. Okay, same general pattern, a little bit more mixed. Um, and you have to remember there are some caregiver or, or commercial areas that are distributed among these where maybe the confidence that people are really paying close attention isn't so high. Um, suburban areas though, Arlington, Bexley, Worthington, advantaged. Uh, locations where caregivers think neighbors would come to the defense of the threat. Would they intervene if there's a problem? Okay. Uh, again, same pattern, very low levels here. 
Okay, so you're getting the idea, right? Um, trust, same general pattern. And then do people recognize one another, network ties? A little bit less of a, a link here to the demographic composition and socioeconomic composition. So perhaps this is not as strong a candidate. Um, okay, so I am going to leave it at that just to give you some sense of how the space right around us varies with respect not only to the structural indicators that we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, with respect to neighborhood uh, well-being, but the social environments that are likely linked with those demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. What are the implications of this on an everyday basis uh, for youth, for families, when there is such tremendous inequality in social environments? Um, and the experience of uh, the immediate context. Um, so I, I will stop there and turn it over to Rachel. So um, I'm, I, I'm trained as a planner, which means that I'm an interdisciplinary social scientist, but I spend most of my time applying social science theory to solutions to problems of society. So what that means is my way I look at what Chris has presented and what I'm going to be talking about today are really about what do we want in a place and how do we create it. So. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what we can do about neighborhood um, inequality and I'm going to be focusing on housing specifically because it plays a huge role, of course, in where we live, right? Because we live in houses and houses are in neighborhoods. And so our ability to choose where we live and our ability to uh, find housing in a safe place that we can afford that's good quality and is big enough for our families matters greatly in what we experience in our neighborhoods. So there's a, this is a really old poverty alleviation discussion, frankly. This, this discussion is the, this question of poverty about people or is it about places? Um, Professor Browning talked a lot about the, the perceived disorder of places and we've driven through places, of course, in our metropolitan area that look like they're not well maintained, right? Those are, we, we perceive order in those places. And we also are having a much greater focus now in a policy discussion that spans education, health, and planning about the role of neighborhood in, in, in determining someone's life chances and their health over the long run. So the also where you live affects how much time you have in your day. I remember I took a, I live in Bexley, and I took a bus from Livingston Avenue to downtown, and I was talking to a woman I met in uh, Whitehall, standing by the bus, and every day she took the bus two hours to her job in Dublin. If she missed the bus, she had to wait another hour, she'd be late for work. So that's another way location influences where we are, what, 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 what people experience every day. So the, the thing is though, that we all want particular things, right? So we want uh, economic security. Uh, people, families want this. We want have access to jobs. Jobs aren't in every, you know, so people don't, nowadays don't tend to live near where they work. Uh, we want quality educational experiences for our children. We want to live in a safe place. And we want to, have stable housing, and we want it to be appropriate quality and size. So this is the goal for people. For place, that perception of disorder is often based upon housing quality. Again, safety, that, 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 that perception of disorder influences how safe we feel in a place. Um, we have linked the way we fund education, we've linked to place as well, so that if you live in a community that has a fairly high tax rate, that goes to pay for very good schools. 
if you happen to live in a community that does not fund their schools at a good level, or for some reason doesn't have quality schools and you live in that district, you're out of luck. There are ex exceptions, but I'm not gonna go there right now. <laughs> you also need access to services, those amenities that Professor Browning was talking about. And you need transportation. Whether you have a car, uh, most people have a car, very few people use transit. And of course, community. Actually, I thought the map that Professor Browning showed was kind of funny because with the social networks, Bexley rated really high as a suburb, and that's why people live in Bexley, because of those social networks. That's kind of interesting. So different places have different um, norms around community and engagement. So it's really not people or place. It's people and place. We have to worry about both of those things. This is what we've seen local and nationally. You can't just focus on fixing a place up and expect it to suddenly fix poverty because people get displaced. You also need to focus on what people want for their lives um, and make it possible for people to have choices about where they live. And they, people lack those choices, either, either because of a, a lack of affordable housing um, or because Oops, sorry, I didn't do that. They lack it because either there's a lack of affordable housing or there's a lack of housing opportunities in neighborhoods that they prefer to move, it, move to. So I want to talk a little bit about housing as a solution to these, these neighborhood inequalities. And there are three basic <coughs> policy solutions that we focus on in the US. We focus on uh, fair housing, that is the location of affordable housing or actually fair housing is about race, so ho housing that's available to people of different races and different neighborhoods. In uh, this area, and in a lot of the US, race and income are, are correlated, and so people who are poor also experience racial segregation. We can mix incomes in neighborhoods, either through deliberate development, or through building housing and um, in areas that are white or, high or have uh, good educational outcomes or maybe they're more affluent. Or we can help people with housing mobility, moving where they want to go. So I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn. So fair housing. So fair housing is, uh, arises out of the civil rights, um, the 1968, fair, uh, 1968 Fair Housing Act, which is a, a title of the Fair Housing Act. And only certain characteristics of people are protected under the Fair Housing Act. And in the federal, in the federal legislation, that's race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and family status. So that's kids, families with kids under 18, pregnant women, or those intending uh, to adopt. Ohio has two additional classes. One is a uh, military, and um, the other, of course, my notes are not letting me see it, so I can't remember the other one, I'm sorry, right now. Because these, the, these are not things I remember all the time. But the thing is that to, fair housing has not traditionally been enforced very well. Uh, locations in the, in the US that receive funding from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development are obligated to affirmatively further fair housing. However, finding evidence for the violation of the Fair Housing Act is no small thing, except for some recent developments, which I'm gonna to talk to you about. So, it, for many years, the, one of the few ways of actually bringing a fair housing case against a community, or against a government actor, or against an individual, was to be able to say, you intend to discriminate. And I can show that that was your intent. Now, that's really hard to show that someone intends to discriminate. More recently, we've seen uh, the case of um, disparate impact being used much more frequently. That because you are a person of color, your inability to, to live in this place disparately impacts you. So, more, so the, one of the things that gives me hope is that there's been recent regulations making sure that jurisdictions actually do regional fair housing assessments. So that's some hope that I see. We can mix incomes within a neighborhood. Now, I like this picture because this is Montgomery County, Maryland, 
And this house here is worth over a million dollars. Um, this is a house that's a little less uh, expensive. This one is even less. And this one actually is public housing. So they have an inclusionary zoning program that has created housing opportunities across the entire uh, metropolitan area. We also can um, actually help people move. These are solutions to fair housing lawsuits, housing mobility programs like the experiment that um, Dr. Professor Browning explained earlier. We can give people housing vouchers. Um, the thing is that um, we have a vision of how people move, right? So the vision is that when you're a young, when you're a young adult, you're mobile. And then maybe you get married or you move into the city for a while and then you have a family and then you move out to the suburbs and then you downsize and you're an empty nester. And uh, these things work with life cycle, um, except for if you change jobs or divorce or you travel. And this is, a, this is a notion of housing moves as the resolution of stress between housing needs and housing characteristics. However, for people at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, that's not what happens necessarily. What we probably, this is a, again stylized, so pardon me. Uh, you may have a youth living with a parent, and maybe the parent's a single parent. Uh, maybe there's a grandmother or grandfather taking care of a child, um, and maybe then you have an impoverished senior. And the question is, this, there, this is a group of people who are constantly moving to try to take care of their needs. The cho they, they have, there's very little uh, choice about what to do, and so the only thing they can do is move to make it better. Their moves may not be voluntary, and um, they're moving in response to housing dissolution, abuse, corrupt landlords, disruptive nation, neighbors, a lack of safety, and debt. This is a very different picture of how people engage in the housing market and how they make choices about where they live. So the poor have more exposure to the stressful aspects of housing, basically. So, what we would like to see, I think, is um, that we see that people move because they're pushed or they're pulled to move. Either they have to move for some reason or they have a new job or they're pulled to do it. And we want to see them move, instead of into these worst communities, we want to see them move to better places, right? If they move. Um, I'm focusing on the place part, the, the mobility, the person part of this. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't also be doing community development. I just want to stress that. Um, the thing is that we have, for particular populations, we have an increased likelihood of a forced move versus a discretionary move. And so things happen in this, we can call it a three-dimensional space, really, about how we might think about where people move and how they get there. Because I think a lot of the, the literature, a lot of the policy right now forgets about the stress of housing instability with policy and how that influences where people live. People who do get housing vouchers and do involve themselves in housing mobility programs typically do not end up staying in whatever we think better neighborhoods are. Um, so we want to see people move from these not so good neighborhoods perhaps to good neighborhoods with good, good education, healthy lifestyles. And so with a housing voucher, with a subsidy of some sort, people can make that move. Maybe they can move um, they now have a, a, because they have money, they, can, they have more discretion, so that's more of a pull. And um, we hope they have more choice and maybe they want to move to a place they feel is more safe. And then with additional money for a subsidy, they can actually make a, hopefully, this is like kind of like the idyllic vision of what happens in policy. This doesn't happen usually, but I want to just present it to you. So the question is what really matters, safe neighborhood, stable housing, education quality, access to opportunity, but it's really hard to find quality affordable housing that does all of this. And the question is why? Well, this is a, for Columbus over the last 10 years, or 16 years, sorry. Um, this yellow line is the occupancy rate. So we see it goes from about 93%, no surprise, we had very low occupancy and rental housing during the, sub, with the subprime boom. Right? People were buying homes in a very loose market. And we see the occupancy rate going up to over, 90, over 96% now. Right? So that's a really big change in the market. And then we see the price of housing, of rental housing, 
continuously going up. Now this is an average. In the most expensive uh, neighborhoods, we see rents of $1,200. And in the cheapest neighborhoods with really, really bad housing, we see rents of $500. I don't want to live in those houses personally. So we have this problem with rental housing demand going up. Um, more poverty is also in the suburbs, as Professor Browning's uh, data showed us. The lack of affordable rental housing in the suburbs and a really high housing wage of $15.98. People have to earn almost $16 an hour to be able to afford a two-bedroom apartment. And the, we know that people are not earning that generally. So affordable housing is hard because uh, construction, cost of construction of housing is the costs exceed the amount of rent that you'd have to offer for someone to be able to afford it. We don't have enough subsidies. Only 25% of households that qualify for a housing choice voucher actually get one. We have no source of income protections in our fair housing legislation. So if someone, the landlord doesn't want to rent to someone because they get a voucher, they don't have to. And then we have conflicting uses of housing, which I'm going to talk about very briefly. So we have conflicting paradigms. House is home, right? It's where we live, where we make our lives. It's also, I think, as this particular panel that focuses, it's about social order. In this particular picture, we have some, um, I would say, uh, informal settlements next to some very high rise, upper class. This is inequality for some of it. And housing, because of its permanence, we don't move housing around, tends to reinforce social order. Um, housing is also a land use and a system. We put the housing here, we put the, the uh, the um, industrial piece places here, we kind of separate out, which means if you want access to a job, you often don't live, right, where you can work. Housing is a human right, according to the International Declaration of Human Rights. How does that jive with these other paradigms of housing? And then lastly, of course, housing is an economic good which means that it can cost a lot, and it certainly led to a downturn in the foreclosure crisis and the mortgage crisis. And I would argue that uh, this particular paradigm and uh, these paradigms are in conflict and prevent us from making progress in affordable housing. And uh, I have one, one last slide, which is really, when thinking about housing's role, in this inequality, we think about housing itself, we think about housing as a way to solve social problems, and we think about the choice to get there. And what's important about housing is the cost, the quality, stability, lack of crowding. And we hope that that supports family well-being, community vitality, our nation, actually, access to opportunity, helps to reduce segregation, helps to contribute to health and education, and then we hope that people in that choice have a choice to live in their various neighborhoods, they have a choice of renting and owning, and they have a choice not to be homeless. And that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you. Actually, you know what? I'm going to do this. OK, great. Thank you, Rachel and Chris. Are we going to do the light, lights off a little bit? Well, we could spend you know, the entire Q&A on one of Rachel and Chris's, each of their slides. So I'm aware, uh, we'll, ha we'll be able to come back uh, to a lot of that in the, in the Q&A. What I want to do, is st I want to start with raising some um, bigger uh, questions. I don't know if they're exactly philosophical, but the uh, bigger questions about how we think about neighborhood inequality in the context of the broader themes that we've addressed here um, this week. Uh, so I I'd like to start by asking uh, both of you first to uh, talk a little bit about the role of inequalities specifically, because uh, in the neighborhood inequality literature especially, and, and actually including in your co presentations today, we, thought we talk a lot actually about poverty and deficits and we're, um, you know, what, do, you, do you see this as being really mainly about poverty or do you focus, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think is important about the gap, if anything? between the top and the bottom. You showed us, you each showed us 
ways in which some neighborhoods have a lot of goodies and other neighborhoods don't have a lot of goodies. But I think yeah. it's, it's yeah. a I think it's a problem with economic security mm -hmm. and an, an inability to admit that market market systems create do not serve everyone well. That there is a role for social policy, and that if so, how does this work? So we have an economy, and there are people who and there's an equilibrium point which. Uh, is where we're supposed to have all of our goods delivered. But there are people whose demands are never met because they can't afford that point, mm -hmm. right? And that's a problem. So the, the, the idea that a market economy is actually going to get rid of these kinds of inequalities is ridiculous. But we as a society never talk about that. Mm -hmm. And so, there's a, so if, we're gonna, if we're gonna have a market economy, okay, let's have social supports. Let's pay for childcare. Let's make sure people have enough money for housing. So I see it fundamentally as a, a, an economic problem. I mean, I think race, there's also the historic, right. Right. of course, the, the patterns that we see in Columbus especially are the result of historic redlining mm -hmm. from the 20s to the 60s. Mm -hmm. And so we systematically as a society disinvested in particular neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And we have never, and when we start, a lot of times when we start reinvesting in these neighborhoods, we're not protecting the community that's there. Mm -hmm. And so they get displaced because of that neighborhood upgrading that will happen. So there's, there are racial dynamics that are historic and still play out today. And then there are economic dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think your question <clears throat> raises a lot of, of, of thorny problems. Um, so as, as I heard it, is, is, is it about poverty or is it also about the gap? The gap between the poorest neighborhoods mm -hmm. and the wealthiest mm -hmm. neighborhoods. If that gap moves, are things worse mm -hmm. for the people in the, in the high poverty neighborhood? Or if things were more equal, would that somehow change things? Um, and that's a difficult question. Um, there is some research on that, uh, that that attempts to actually capture inequality, say, across an urban environment, and see whether that contributes to problems above and beyond just the poverty level of the family or the tract that, that an individual resides in. But it's it's mixed, I would say, at this point. Um, uh, predominantly, the effect is is one of poverty. Um, it's it's the level of poverty itself that is making a difference now. Is that inequality, is the presence of that inequality actually associated with the level of poverty that people are experiencing um, and the, the extremes of the distribution? Do they get wider? Um, that's another uh, question as well um, and goes to the origin of high poverty communities. And I'll just raise one other issue. Um, we think about, I talked about neighborhood inequality as the distribution of tracts with respect to economic characteristics, social environment, other stru social structural characteristics, and so on. You have a distribution of tract characteristics uh, on these various dimensions. There are, there's also a distribution within the tract. So uh, what are we talking about here? Mixed income housing, for instance, is about creating some inequality in high poverty tracts is one way of putting it. Mm -hmm. A high concentrated poverty neighborhood, if you put some uh, middle income housing in there, that creates some inequality. Is that uh, a bad thing? Probably not. There's a theory of mixed income housing. I'd be interested in hearing <laughs> Rachel's thoughts on this. Um, uh, you know, we, we try to figure out whether mixed income housing uh, works for poor populations and the conditions under which it's gonna work and the mechanisms and so on. Um, but there are also reasons, possible reasons, to believe that inequality is not, uh, uh, that kind of inequality is not such a great thing as well. And uh, I don't think we have enough research on understanding the conditions under which within neighborhood inequality is gonna be beneficial or not. Can I, can I talk to that for a sure. minute? So um, I think in the 80s when we were writing about, people were writing about concentrated poverty and the culture of poverty, um, there's a book that came out that had a hypothesis about inequality in neighborhoods. Uh, I, can't, I, I think Massey was the author of this piece. 
and uh, yeah, for the yeah, yeah. yeah, you know the yeah, backyard, yeah. right? Yeah. And the hypothesis was that in mixed neighborhoods, um, mixed income neighborhoods, if there are cooperative relationships among people, then that's a beneficial thing for everybody. If residents compete for resources, then we do not have good outcomes. So the relationships that people have with each other within neighborhoods matters a lot. So, so, there, so that, but that was a hypothesis. And I think when we see um, the, the, what's going on in, the, uh, on in some of the more recent research that's come out about life in mixed income communities in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, Mark Joseph and uh, Rob Chaskin just had a book come out on this. We see that the, uh, that the relationships that people have uh, recreate stigma. And this is because the folks setting the norms in the neighborhood don't take, which are usually the folks who own the market rate housing, um, don't take into account whatever norms of behavior or culture or whatever is going on for everybody else. So that's an exclusion, right? And then the way to counteract that is to create um, community building opportunities where people who are neighbors come together around common interests. So there's a mixed income neighborhood in Seattle called New Holly. And um, this is uh, the community building in that neighborhood. They have these, uh, they have committees. So they have a traffic committee. So if you are someone who's worried about people driving quickly through the development, you join the traffic committee. There's the playground committee, there's a trash committee. And so they try to create those things that people care about, uh, that people, regardless of, their, of where they are in their lives, care about to create those positive relationships. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's a very interesting question. We have some research. Uh, the, the other part of this study is an, actually uh, an effort to figure out where people really go. So uh, the, the part of the presentation I didn't really spend as much time on is this sort of challenge to this notion that, that your neighborhood is your primary okay. exposure space. Well, we all know we're, we don't spend 24 hours in our census tract. We move around a fair amount. Uh, most people do, it turns out. Uh, youth spend about 15% uh, of their time in their home census tract. So uh, they spend 50% of their time at home and the rest is outside their census tract. So our neighborhood models that look at the characteristics of the place they live and to try to predict outcomes may not be getting the exposure classification correct, uh, in all likelihood not. So, um, but the question is, uh, you know, what, what happens in, in unequal neighborhoods to patterns of intersection. Do people even show up at the same place mm -hmm. when they live in an unequal neighborhood? Mm -hmm. um, and we've used some existing data from LA to try to, to figure this out, um, just getting basic routine activity locations and then um, determining whether people of different classes are actually going. Are they intersecting at the grocery store, workplace, school, and so on? Um, and uh, not surprisingly, on average, they don't. Right? There's, uh, if you're of a different socioeconomic class and you live in the same place, even controlling how far away you live within the track, you're still much less likely to show up in the same place. But there are conditions under which that will vary. So when it's a high trust community, this is consistent with what yep. the hypothesis might creating, be, creating trust, yeah. there's no cross class yep. uh, right. divide. Mm -hmm. People are showing up in the same place when there's a high level of trust. Yep. That high level of trust is itself affected by the level of within neighborhood inequality. So highly unequal neighborhoods where you've got a million dollar house next to public housing may have a harder time doing this. That's right. And there, there is some suggestion that maybe you want to focus the distribution uh, over a particular range of the economic scale to make sure that you don't have right. this fragmentation, that people actually yeah. do uh, have the, the conditions under which uh, trust can emerge. For, it's for those of it, let me introduce. Okay. Uh, for those who have been uh, attended yesterday, um, Richard Wilkinson, of course, talked a lot about the importance of building a companionable society, um, and he. But he ended his talk yesterday, at least, by by nodding to talking a lot about workplace democracy. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear today about the the how this might how this works in communities within communities. This this is issue of the relationship between inequality and companionability or trust. Uh, do you think that this, this, this we, will, we maybe want some inequality but not too much? We want some inequality because that means that the poor aren't isolated, but 
we don't want too much because that breaks down trust. Is that an empirical observation about American society, U.S. society today? Or is it a more general claim? I mean, and how do we know that? I mean, it, it sounds like you're both saying we don't really understand this that well. But yeah, I think, I think there's been some research mm -hmm. uh, suggesting that we want to have a more restricted range, uh, posing that as a, a probably more beneficial arrangement. Um, but I don't, uh, I don't know how extensively this has been investigated. There's Certainly, some, there's, I mean, people who are who are doing, who are building mixed income housing and studying it, like, are talking about this a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, it comes, I always end up at this place when I talk about this topic. Um, there's the, this notion of a contact hypothesis, or contact theory, right? Which is Gordon Alport, 1959. I love that we that like we knew this stuff 70 years ago. Um, so his hypothesis, which is actually shown to be pretty consistent over time, is that when you put people in situations where uh, they have similar social status, then racial differences um, don't matter as much and they have uh, more positive in interactions with each other. So this work over the past 70 years has been expanded to um, to look at people on teams, so not just socioeconomic status, but teams, schools, uh, apartment, whatever, all these different kinds of situations where people have, have a perception of similar status. And I have an exam example, can I show you an sure, anecdote? So I lived in a neighborhood in Seattle before I moved here, and um, my neighbor's kids were outside all the time hanging out, and I thought, oh my gosh, what are those kids doing hanging out? They're all grumpy and stuff. Okay, so some of his mail got misdirected to me, and it was from the American Sociological Association. Turns out he was a graduate student in sociology. Suddenly, I had something in common with him, right? So that was really about perception. It was really about my perception of him and that family and who they were. So if you can, so I, I think what, I think the message I think is that if you just put people next to each other in neighborhoods, you're probably not gonna have very good outcomes in terms of positive relationships among neighbors. And if you have big perceptions of disparity, it's not gonna be very helpful, which is what you're talking about with the very the big house and the little houses, which actually in mm -hmm. um, parts of Montgomery County Royal, that's exactly what they did with inclusionary zoning. It's very mm -hmm. bad. Um, but so there has to be really in, a lot of intentionality about how you foster those relationships and how you build those places. Good. Well, we could we could talk about this further, but I'm gonna I'm gonna switch uh, switch gears just uh, just slightly here. Um, well, I do, do I want I was gonna ask what would neighborhood equality look like, but I think you've started to talk about that already. You know, we've talked we, we the you know more companionable places. I still am not very clear on whether do we need to pull up those less poor places, make them less poor. Do, what do we do with the rich? Don't we need to do something to the rich places? We need to do both. So what do we do to the rich places? We enforce fair housing laws. Okay. What? <laughs> Sorry. So, so. <laughs> See, that's the clearest answer we've gotten. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's just so. go home. We're yeah. set. <laughs> no, no. And you provide enough, you, and you create opportunities for housing in those neighborhoods, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the question is really, how do you deal with NIMBYism and mm -hmm. the unfounded fear that affordable housing will decrease property values? Mm -hmm. Because that is actually, if it's well maintained affordable housing, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's also racial uh, prejudice. That's right. Uh, as well, right. social exclusion. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so as to what to do, I think Rachel is more uh, equipped. But I can describe <laughs> what some of the patterns are that I think are problematic and that contribute to these dynamics. Yeah. And in, in the data that, that we have, one, one thing that we've noticed is that, uh, and again, the, the the de design of the studies to actually get exposures. So we want to know where kids are, and to some extent caregivers, are actually going in their everyday lives. So um, there's a long-standing hypothesis focused on racially segregated, low-income neighborhoods under the assumption that the kids in those neighborhoods are socially isolated, they're exposed to that context, and that context must be responsible for their uh, compromised outcomes. It's assuming that that context is, in fact, their primary exposure. Um, well, it turns out that if you actually look at what kids' range of exposures are, uh, 
young African American kids' range of, of exposures with respect to race, socioeconomic status, and so on are quite variable. And they're, over the course of their day, they're exposed to lots of different kinds of neighborhoods. White kids are exposed to white places. They are the ones that are segregated, not the African American okay. youth. Right. So the idea that the, the segregation of experience is responsible for young African American youth and, and uh, explaining some of the disparities there, I think needs to be questioned. In fact, we may need to understand what it is about navigating multiple spaces and the reception of uh, African American youth in some other context that they uh, have to navigate that might be accounting for differences in behavioral outcomes, health disparities, and so on as well. That's not to discount the need to understand what their residential context is about and to focus on community development uh, needs in those areas. But I think we need to be a little bit more uh, careful about what uh, exposures are actually resulting okay. in um, right. when we think about disparities. So. Chris, what I, what I really like about what you, this work that you're doing is because I think um, we know that people's, people's social networks are aspatial. Right? Networks are not bound by space. And what your work is showing is that actually our lives are not bound by space either. Right? Where we, the spaces that we experience are diverse. And it's how the interactions that happen in those environments that may shape us. And these were really wonderful. Do you think we would change the conversation about neighborhood inequality and poverty if we talked about affluent white people as being segregated? I mean, because it sounds like some people are spatially bounded and it's affluent white people. Yep, that's right. Yeah. I mean, that's an observation that, that we've known, uh, obviously, Massey's work right, right. and uh, uh, our own, or at least formerly, uh, uh, Lori Crevo right. has looked at the, the, the residential segregation of affluent people, um, but uh, we haven't had an opportunity to really focus on, I mean, actually, on exposures. There's, a, but, there's someone yeah, doing uh, that, actually, in the, oh my gosh, up, I just hit uh, Hunter College, there's a woman working on that. Hmm. Actually, just really. Okay. I've done a little work on this. Some of you who know okay. my work, um, <laughs> actually, um, and so maybe a leading question here. But um, but actually, I got. It's funny. Even even sociologists. I, I actually had a prominent sociologist say to me, "There's something a little funny about studying affluent people," and I thought, "What? Yeah. <laughs> so what? We're only supposed to study poor people. Poor people are only the objects of our mm -hmm. of our investigation." Um, and so uh, I do think there's a certain l resistance to, especially since affluent white, you know, academics are disproportionately affluent white people living in spatially bounded places, um, uh, to opening up the, the conversation in that way. So um, uh, my, a little bit of my two cents there. Um, so let me, let me uh, uh, try, <laughs> I'm not a philosopher, but I'm sort of playing one a little, I mean, I'm not really playing one, but I'm standing in a little bit, um, and I'd like to ask just a couple of questions um, of, about the role of philosophy here before we open the, up to Q&A. And the first, I guess, is kind of a moral uh, question. So we, uh, we talk, right, we're here, uh, we've talked a number of times how we're in this lovely space, spending this, this time together, um, able to think about and ask questions about inequality. Uh, so many of us here in this university study inequality, but actually very few of us study inequality in our community, uh, unlike, unlike both of you. So do you feel, is there, a, is, is there an element of your focus on our community that is moral or ethical that you think we owe our local community? You know, do we owe something uh, to, to bring our expertise to these local communities? Um, do you think that that's overwrought and sentimental uh, that, that we really should be thinking about, you know, that we, we have our various expertise and we can help the world in lots of ways? Uh, what's, your, what's your feeling about local commitments for academics? Not just feeling, just thoughts. I'll just jump in. Okay. Um, so I, I, um, I went into this field because I wanted to create change, not because I wanted to study, and, and because I was fascinated by what people thought a good community was. Why wasn't a mixed income community a good community? Right? That was basically mm -hmm. the, the question I started with. So, and I wanted to understand values of communities. So I think it is very much a moral question of you know why I do this, mm -hmm. and it's one reason that I started the housing dialogue, right? Was to be able to make those connections with people working in the field, so that I could understand, or other academics too, could understand what's going on as they try to do this work, and how does my work influence that, 
and what should, what should change about what I do given what they're doing. Uh, so, it, and I, I also think there's a, a, an obligation ethically a, as, a, as, a, as an academic not to make things worse. Hmm. Hmm. Right? Oh, wow, well, yeah. Right? Not, not to make things worse. And, and so yeah. we are, we're, so we're, I'm, I'm, work, I mean, I, I'm working on a, a potential program that would provide subsidies, in particular um, school districts with, high, with good quality schools, uh, would provide a subsidy for apartments for families in those places. And so this is the, the moral obligation. Or what moral obligation do I have to these families who are going to move to these places as somebody's creating a demonstration program, mm -hmm. right? It's a three-year program. They're not going to be able to afford this apartment after the first three years. What do we do? Should we be doing this at all? So it's a huge moral question. And so, you know, what do they want? Well, they, they want to live in a stable place for three years, it turns out. So this is not my, it's not my decision to make about what they want, though. So it's a, it's a yeah, it is very much, I'm, I'm very much morally engaged with the impact of what I do. And you've, and you've made it even bigger than the local, yeah. Yes, exactly. Just in general, researcher ethics, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, you know, I, I, I think the moral obligation is to shed light on the process. Uh, that's the way I feel about it, is that, that in some ways, although this is a structured format, it's allowing if we focus on the social environmental characteristics above and beyond what we, we, care, we collect with respect to census data and so on, we're allowing these communities to have a voice in their experience and to shed light on the possible mechanisms through which change might be addressed. Um, and so th that's one of the ways I think about this. Um, but uh, it, it's also important, I think, not just to collect the data and walk away and publish your right. papers. Um, one advantage of being in the local context is to, to be able to then have the opportunity for outreach. Is any of this information useful That's to right. communities? Um, and it, you know, does it, does it help them shed light on some of their own questions? And hopefully the, that will be another path through which uh, the data become useful. Mm -hmm. Would philosophers be useful to us in this, in, in evaluating these, uh, uh, these uh, questions and other questions related to these? I mean, that's one of the goals of this series is to is to bring us together. I I, uh, I have a history, and some of the people I know in social science do engage quite frequently with philosophers who start uh, publish and so on. I can't say that I I can think of people in the neighborhood inequality area who are collaborating with philosophers or other humanities. Uh, scholars, so could you just um, t talk a little bit? About, I mean, do you, are there pieces of what we've already talked about here that you think it would be helpful to, you know, an expert on ethics, on ethics, uh, uh, to engage with you on, or is there another piece of this that you think are there other kinds of problems, troubles, in thinking through this literature that um, that philosophy could help us with? The the, the last <coughs> second to last slide I showed is actually uh, for a piece by Tim Iglesias who presents. It's a chap It's a chapter on housing ethics in a volume on legal aspects of uh, nonprofit, mm -hmm. private and nonprofit partnerships in the provision of housing. And so he's presenting these paradigms as um, conflicting ethics, basically. So I think, um, I think, so there's already some, so yes, yeah, so I already yeah, overstated, right, there oh, are, yeah, there are, there's, there's good correction. Right, mm -hmm. but the, um, I have a huge, so, <laughs> I have a huge critique. So I was there, <laughs> I, I taught a class called, uh, at one point, called, um, what is it, Social Justice and Public Policy. And so we'd read public policy pieces, and then we'd read a, an accompanying uh, social policy, um, political philosophy or ethics piece. And um, the, the reason I'm, so I guess the, I think that always when we're talking about the targets and our concerns about, um, neighborhoods and, and, and justice and equity, those are all underlying ethical problems mm -hmm. that philosophers should be able to help us deal with. So I'd like, I, we, and I know that in other countries, philosophers actually like work for the government, helping them to make decisions in Canada. I was, so one of the folks we read for that class worked for the Canadian government as a, as a philosopher. And I thought, wow, that's just, wow, can we do that here? That would be great. Anyway, 
So that's my, my two cents on that one. Okay, yes. fair housing and philosophers in the government. Yes, sorry. thank you. <laughs> to a concrete policy. Um, well, my father was a, a moral philosopher of the social sciences. So he, this was his guiding question throughout his life, was how does morality enter into uh, the, question we, the questions we ask in social science and even the process by which we do social science. So I guess this is always lingering in the background um, for me. And I'm also always interested in how others who are, have that lens on what we do see moral thinking in our allegedly positivist right. uh, approaches mm -hmm. and how it still makes its way in um, and how that may be influencing not only our questions, but the results of our analysis and so on. So um, th that's, that's a question I, I always ask of, of what I'm doing. Um, but uh, more broadly, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how ph philosophers would react to this notion that you know, we have sort of an environmental justice movement when people think about environmental justice, they're thinking about pollution largely and uh, you know, toxic environments and so on. But um, is there, uh, are there moral approaches to thinking about inequities in social environments? Uh, I, you know, I'm sure there's discussion about this as well. And I would like to hear uh, you know, how, how moral philosophers would interact with these data um, and some of the approaches we've taken to, 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 in their own work and how they would think about injustice in the social environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Well, this is, so it seems like a pretty good time to open it up for, um, for questions and discussion with the audience. But let me, I, I, I wanted to say that when, when Rachel said, don't, let's not do harm, I mean, this, this is a place that I get, uh, that's, that's something that troubles me, especially we have a set incentive structures that encourage certain kinds of work and encourage certain you know, publication patterns and so on. Don't encourage us to talk to the public uh, that much, but maybe talk to them sometimes. But maybe we're, when we're talking to the public, maybe it's not like our A game because it's not the stuff that's going to give us the most. You know, and when I, when I get engaged in policy conversations, I was talking with um, uh, uh, some people at dinner about this last night that you know, you, 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 have to, you have to develop a new kind of language and way of engaging with the public. There are all kinds of questions about our moral responsibilities to, to communicate this work. But so, so I, and that what gets me, I, I usually, you know, what keeps me up at night when I'm in DC, which isn't that often, but when I'm there talking to policy people is did I just, you know, give someone this justification that was, right. uh, you know, for this pet policy of theirs that, that I personally despise? Um, um, so it almost, to me, this first do you no know, harm kind of impulse is, a, it, to me, is, is somewhat paralyzing. Um, it, you know, I don't feel like a great expert in, in communicating the information. Obviously, I could, could become better at it. But, um, but that's one of the places, I think, and I think I'm not the only academic to feel that way. I think often we feel that, that the public misunderstands the work and then it can be misused. Or shaping this, these, these ideas about mobility, Yeah. right? So that's like... Right, mobility. What if you care right. about communities and you want to maintain political power for concentrated racial community? I mean, you know, this is like, it's a, um, these, these are all, all of the decisions we make in policy are political decisions, mm -hmm. right? And so they're all, and they all have, and they all influence power structures. And so it's, you have to, I, I find that sometimes when I, when I structure a paper, I think about, well, what if someone on the other side of the political spectrum read this paper? Mm -hmm. How would they take it? Am I giving fodder mm -hmm. to something that I think is abhorrent? Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm trying very, very consciously to, to think about how do I frame the research mm -hmm. because of that. But yeah, it, it can be debilitating, yeah. absolutely. It's a, a version of the dirty hands problem. Right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so let me address this last point. Um, so I feel I'm a politically engaged scholar. Um, but I'm a little troubled that you are concerned about how other people would use knowledge. I mean, um, I, I feel like it's my responsibility to advocate for my point of view, but it's ultimately not my decision what's going to happen. I have a, you know, I have a voice in a democracy. And, and I, I am tempted to feel that, um, and perhaps naively, 
that, that we uh, send out our, what we've learned and what we've um, proven uh, as best we can, and that's our responsibility. Um, in a situation where uh, you felt like there was no democracy, I mean, you can obviously construct social, political systems where, where that isn't the case. Um, but that would raise other questions. So, so the MacArthur Foundation, uh, for about five years, funded something called How Housing Matters. And what they did with each of these scholars who they funded was they trained them and had to message their research, mm -hmm. actually. So I, I think that it's uh, information, p okay, this po policy doesn't happen Policymakers don't make decisions because of our research. They make decisions about the way they think about something and then they read the research. We'd like to think that our research influences policy, it can, but we can't just be uh, assuming that happens in a, in a, a power-free environment. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I'll just say briefly, I think that's a very fair point. I think the question is whether or not, if, if, I mean, what I worry about more is my responsibility for being effective in communicating you know, the research. It's not, it's not so much that I think I can control everything right. that ever happens with my research, but have I, have I, you know, am I good at getting it across? And, you know, Bruno Latour, would, would he say that the fate of facts and technology are in later users' hands, right? That's part of putting it out there. Often in, in, in our world, if you submit a paper, you have an empirical finding, an editor will come back and say, can, can you throw some policy recommendations <laughs> in here? Because, yeah, that might help beef yeah. things up. But, um, and, and frankly, I am uncomfortable with that unless I have thought very carefully about the policy recommendation. Ideally, this is a, a place for the intersection of folks, and I think Rachel's a good example of, of a, you know, an empirical social scientist that has a heavy policy bent and is someone who is, has the expertise in both domains to make uh, legitimate policy recommendations that are well informed. Not every social scientist is that kind of researcher. Um, and the process itself should not force this uh, uh, on publications when, in fact, that's not really the expertise necessarily of the. So th in some ways, there's some management of the dissemination of information that, um, and some practices and norms that we could develop uh, that might improve this pathway for, uh, through which the information is disseminated. So what, obviously, you know, if we'd say we have any influence whatsoever, maybe the case that people are cherry picking uh, yeah. based on their previous policy inclination, but to the extent that we do have any influence, that's an opportunity uh, for collaboration across traditional mm -hmm. social science and policy um, and care in the publication process to ensure that we take this seriously. Mm -hmm. um, that's right. So Chris, your comments about um, a few minutes ago um, relative to um, environmental justice are very timely. Um, so I'm one of those people who's interested in um, uh, non-chemical, well, chemical stressors. So you did a good job in terms of your study looking at non-chemical stressors. And mm -hmm. so what are your provisions, and I see that work is funded by NIDA, um, what are your provisions for bringing in to the you know, through here, the impacts, uh, unintentional or not, um, regarding um, chemical stressors, and, and, and how are you gonna quantify that in a spatio-temporal manner uh, in, in your study? So how, how would we bring in actual uh, information about? Environmental exposure. Toxicity yes. in the environment, yes. pollutants and so on, in addition yes. to? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I will defer this question to my hopefully uh, future collaborator, Carrie Ard, oh. who has data <laughs> on. on <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Join in. Uh, well, there's, there's a very interesting potential intersection here yeah. of social and uh, sort of mm -hmm. chemical yeah, uh, influence. Th there could be an interaction there. In other yeah. words, the social environment mm -hmm. makes one more vulnerable to the effects of pollutants. But I'll. I'll I have temporal spatial data that looks at industrial chemicals, um, 600 different industrial chemicals over time. 
um, in Franklin County that we're going to be connecting. Um, uh, I'm going to be connecting. Yes, well done. Good job. <laughs> That's great. I can't wait to talk. Yeah. Hello. What roughly is the story for why Columbus has evolved to have a starker segregation disparity than other cities? Um, yeah, well, I, actually, I don't necessarily think that it has a, a start, you know, it looks a lot like um, other Midwestern uh, sort of Rust Belt, Chicago, uh, you know, the, the segregation pattern, it, it's particularly bad here. You could say it's in the, you know, whatever, it's the top, top 10. Uh, but I don't think that this pattern is that unusual, actually. It's just a little bit worse. Than, than most. It's not uh, a lot worse. I'm sorry? It's not a lot worse. It doesn't stand out as particularly bad, say, by, again, by comparison with Chicago with other Midwestern cities in terms of segregation uh, patterns. It just happens to be in that top 10 group. But the, the, the top 20 probably don't look that different. Um, you know, there are marginal differences here. In terms of the history, actually, you might be able to say more yeah, I mean, about how we got. Enough, but if I was thinking it's interesting because I was just thinking about what you said about that they're in the top, they are in the, they're in actually I think in the top five or something, yeah. we are. So we don't, we don't stick out from other places, but I think that the, the Midwestern, so okay, so I talked a little bit about um, redlining and uh, the, um, we also had restricted covenants on properties that prevented people of color, Jews, Mexicans, from living in these neighborhoods. These are neighborhoods like Upper Arlington, which is still very white. Um, Grandview, no, yeah, Grandview, I think. Um, so these covenants were outlawed with the, the Fair Housing Act. Um, in some states, they were outlawed before the Fair Housing Act by state Fair Housing Acts. So we have a lot of housing actions besides this uh, disinvestment by, by banks and lack of investment that created this pattern we see. I think what exacerbates it in the Midwest is also a lot of, um, uh, having a lot of different jurisdictions. And in, um, in a lot of places you have the central city is its own jurisdiction, and then there are suburbs around it, and people in the suburbs don't necessarily ever have to go into the central city, right? And so there's really no, like think of Detroit. Detroit is like the, one of the it's, it's like the donut hole, right? Because the suburbs' interests are not connected to the central city. So I actually, th I think in some ways, for me, Columbus is an anomaly because we were actually able to, Columbus has actually annexed a lot of land, right? So we have a lot of these jurisdictions. So for me, I'm thinking, well, why, I, ha I haven't figured out why Colum Columbus is like this because it has kind of this massive footprint. So I, I think it's a great question. <laughs> Maybe someone should research that. I don't know. Do you have any research on the impact of public spaces, particularly like parks, on the ability of uh, communities, e either a community that has income uh, inequality within it or areas that are near each other. Well, is there any impact on how parks, uh, what impact do parks have on, on uh, the ability of people to intersect? That's a really good question. Um, and uh, so I think that the best set of hypotheses about this come from uh, Jane Jacobs. So J Jane Jacobs wrote a book called Death and Life, Great American Cities. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, she was an urban planner, uh, ar arguably, um, although an amazing sociologist. And um, she, her argument was parks can be incredible, but it depends on the context. You can't have a, a park that's isolated from other amenities that generate organic street life. Uh, and the classic example in her book is Rittenhouse Square Park in Philadelphia, which is surrounded by dense commerce, lots of other things happening. People crisscross that park. It is designed well with benches right on the pathway so that people can watch others, which is uh, uh, an activity she almost suggests is human nature. Um, and uh, that's a very effective park, a park that's isolated from other uh, sources of street 
uh, ecology and movement um, uh, becomes a breeding ground for crime. And uh, the classic public housing model used in uh, various places, uh, notably in Chicago, the Robert Taylor Homes, Stateway Gardens, and so on, uh, is called a tower in a park, the tower in the park model, which is essentially you know, giant uh, housing unit surrounded by grass. This is thought to be park. People will be you know, uh, engaging in you know, outdoor activity in, in this park space, but it basically became a breeding ground for crime because the attention to context was not there. Um, so uh, the short answer is it depends, and it depends heavily on the, the ecological context of the park, I would argue. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to uh, ask you, so we've talked about class and race, but I'd like to extend the conversation to gender. Um, so we know that, you know, although we oftentimes think about context as being gender neutral, they're quite gendered. Um, and so I'd like to, uh, you know, further understand how do men and women differentially experience context? Um, so for example, you could think about single parenthood or more specifically single motherhood. Um, so how, do, how does single motherhood exacerbate inequalities within context, um, considering that there's evidence to suggest that single mothers are oftentimes discriminated against by landlords um, as well in, uh, as in ev evictions? Um, so I'd like to kind of, you know, extend this conversation to how does gender matter? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question in terms of the housing. Uh, yeah. you know, obviously, uh, I think Rachel probably has a lot to say about that. Um, the part of the, had I had 10 more <laughs> minutes, which I knew I didn't, but I would have gone into uh, one of the first analyses we've done with these data, which are um, essentially trying to get at how environments differentially impact the physiological stress outcomes of girls and boys. Part of the problem of the way we do this research is typically what we do is we just say, okay, you know, we've got a group of kids here and they, they reside in this census tract. We're gonna link the characteristics of this census tract to their outcomes. What that implies is that there is comparable exposure to that census tract. And therefore, any differences in the impact of that environment have to do just with the difference of reception of the environment, not the difference in exposure. Uh, so essentially, Every analysis that looks at neighborhood context effects on uh, gendered outcomes blends in an uninterpretable way exposure and reception. And that's hundreds of papers. We just don't know actually what's happening. We don't know whether boys and girls are comparably exposed to the env environment, they receive it differently, or they just have differential exposures to that environment. So um, that's one of the main things that we want to try to understand is are, are girls and boys differentially exposed, exposed to their neighborhood environments? Uh, do, is there more in-home supervision of one versus the other? Uh, do they spend more time outside? Where are they going? And that process is gendered, and likely the, uh, e once we account for that, then we can see whether environments are actually influencing gender, uh, boys and girls differentially. So that's, that's our yeah. Any quick here. finding on those? Any quick answer to anyone yeah, else? Um, the, um, so in planning, this is actually starting to be a field of study, trying to figure out, how, trying to understand how gendered our assumptions are about good cities and good places. And there's a, a, um, a country in Northern Europe that has started implementing um, more gender equity in the way they plan their cities. So things like making sure that, care, assuming that women are caregivers, making sure that baby carriages can get on the transit, um, changing the way they, people interact with buses, the bus system, changing the way people interact with um, parks, et cetera, trying to really um, make some changes. So I think I would say that it's, it's coming. Um, there's also some early work that was done on, on how we build houses. And we build houses basically for nuclear families, not for people who might need to share a house because it makes life better for their, you know, so there's lots of things that we could do in terms of a built environment that would make things much more equitable. I know we're coming to the end of our time. Should we wrap it up? Should I take one more question and wrap it up? One more question? Okay, one more question. Oh. We'll talk. <laughs> I thought it was interesting how uh, the community building activities could have such an impact on mixed income uh, communities. Um, a lot of what you mentioned, uh, the examples like the traffic committee seem to be internal to the community. I was just wondering how uh, external organizations or institutions like Ohio State, how they could impact 
uh, community building in mixed income communities and if these methods have been effective. I'm trying to figure out how to answer that question. So one of the thing about one of the things about um, influence relationships within communities is that you want to be of the community and you want to have a long and stable relationship with that community. So if you're going to be involved in a community and start doing organizing efforts like that, it needs to be a, a long-term commitment to be involved so that, they, that, so that you are a reasonable and viable partner in doing that work. And I, I would think that the work that the university has done in Wyland Park is actually a good example of a very, very long-term commitment to be a long-standing partner in growing community capacity and involving the community in decision-making about its place and creating those relationships or enhancing those relationships. I think it's, it's particularly problematic because in some ways the conditions under which an institution like Ohio State will be seen as a potential outsider are associated with the conditions that often demand the most intervention. Um, so uh, those are uh, communities that don't have a strong organizational base and if they do have organizations present, they tend to be isolated. They, are, they don't have network connections with other institutions across the city, uh, including universities and so on. They haven't developed them as well. And that itself may have contributed to the problems that they're experiencing in the neighborhood. So um, it's, it's a tough right. problem. And in some cases, um, universities can help communities start new community organizations mm -hmm. where there is a lack of that already. Uh, with foundation partners, that's happened. I've seen, seen that happen in many in many places, actually, where the the it's the it's the it's the incubator, but after a while, it steps back. Well, we could go all afternoon, I think, but um, uh, we have to end. Uh, so thank you very much, Rachel and Chris, for a really stimulating session. Wonderful. <laughs>